Everyone ready? Thank you, thank you all for coming. My name is James Backus, and I've been asked to moderate uh, this panel this afternoon. Uh, I was um, reading the program for the forum this week, and uh, I was struck by the fact that at least half, possibly more, of the uh, panels during the three days involved in one way or another the topic of sustainable development and the relationship between trade and the trading system and sustainable development. In 1995, when we established the World Trade Organization, that would have been unthinkable. Now uh, we're moving sustainable development rightly much more into the mainstream of trade thought. It was not long after 1995 and the establishment of the WTO that uh, something called the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development was also created. And in all the years since, I see TSD has been on the forefront in uh, trying to move the topic of trade and sustainable development and the relationship between the two into the center of WTO discussions and action. So it's only appropriate that uh, among all the many panels during this forum this week, there should be this one. Uh, by ICTSD, and I believe that ICTSD uh, is 20 years on, uh, still a very important place to look for new ideas on the relationships between trade and sustainable development, and I would say a whole lot more. Looking back to uh, the early years of the WTO, I, um, I think it's fair to say that the question of looking beyond the confines of uh, this particular house here on uh, this lakeside in Geneva uh, to the wider world for legal knowledge and for wider perspective uh, emerged in WTO dispute settlement uh, first before it became a topic in the broader work of the WTO. It was in the gasoline case in the very first appeal before the appellate body that uh, the appellate body pointed out that WTO law should not be viewed in clinical isolation from other public international law. Uh, to all international lawyers, uh, this was obvious. To those who had been the workhorses of the GATT for nearly half a century, it was a revelation. Uh, then it was in 1998 in the shrimp turtle appeal that the appellate body pointed out that, uh, oh yes, look at this language in the preamble to the WTO agreement on which every single member of the WTO agreed. It says there that in pursuing our work as the World Trade Organization, we need to make certain that all trade and other economic endeavor is conducted consistently with the objectives of sustainable development. And the appellate body said at that time in that ruling that um, this particular context uh, for obligations in the WTO treaty uh, should be employed in clarifying WTO obligations. Interestingly, there's been very little follow-up in WTO jurisprudence since that time uh, because um, WTO members in bringing cases and defending cases have not yet found it uh, necessary to point toward that ruling and ask the appellate body to elaborate on it. Perhaps this will change. 
to uh, better understand some of the vast dimensions of connecting trade with the objectives of sustainable development, which I would argue are today reduced to writing in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which um, at last look all the WTO members signed and agreed to, um, we should call upon members of the staff of the ICTSD, who range now across many different areas. So we're just going to give you a sampling today of uh, some of the breadth of uh, the uh, center's expertise, be suggestive of some of the ways in which the WTO could and should be going in uh, properly connecting trade with sustainable development, and um, importantly, solicit your views on some of these issues as well. We're going to do this a little bit differently than is commonly done in these panels. We're going to um, have a couple of speakers and then have questions, then have more speakers and then have questions, and then have a last speaker, and if there's time remaining, have more questions. This is in the hope that we will actually have time for questions. <laughs> um, our first uh, presenter is uh, Wallace Cheng, who is Director of China for G20, G20 and Global Economic Governance uh, for the Center. Wallace. Thank you, James. Um, now we are in WTO. How many of you are optimistic about the MC11 of the WTO? Are, are you optimistic about the role that WTO can play in achieving SDGs? If you are skeptical or pessimistic, I was with you. <laughs> uh, actually, I was very depressed in the first half of this year because of economic nationalism, political nativism, lack of action in moving towards SDGs. On 6th July, I land, when I landed in Hamburg on the eve of G20 summit, I saw thousands of protesters, burning cars, broken shops, and thousands of policemen which are militarized, they like armies. I am totally lost. This should be a time for party, right? So I think that is the context uh, of today's uh, difficulties. But on 7th of July, I met someone who changed my attitude. Uh, on that morning, we organized a, a roundtable uh, with uh, two German think tanks on the G20 trade agenda uh, and MC11. Madame Susanna Makora, chairperson of MC11 and the foreign, former foreign minister of Argentina joined us for the whole session. She, she is very relaxed and also very confident. She said as a host of both w MC11 of WTO and the host of G20 summit in 2018, Argentina will keep the SDG at the center of the agenda. She also said, I quote, financing for development is key in 2030 agenda. Foreign investment, integrated supply chains and trade were at the center what came out of the Addis, Addis recommendations and cannot be forgotten. On the following day, I also read the G20 leaders declaration. I find they have kept SDGs and M MC11 clearly in their minds. Maybe we have some reason to be a little bit optimistic. Uh, accounting for 80% of global GDP, G20 leaders, the leaders of G20 economies stress that trade and investment are important engines for sustainable growth. 
They also claim that strong, sustainable, inclusive growth remains G20's highest priority. And this sustainable growth is ultimately the economic foundation for achieving SDGs. We discussed, as uh, James in the, his introduction remarks, about uh, environment aspect, social aspect, but we, we cannot forget that economic, sustainable economic growth is one of the uh, pillars of SDGs as well, as a foundation. Leaders also committed to work together with all WTO members make MC11 of WTO a success. G20 leaders have highlighted six areas which can be good candidates for trade ministers to discuss in Argentina at the MC11. First one is about the crucial role of rule-based international trading system. Leaders underlines the the principles of non-discrimination and fighting protectionism. At MC11, it, is, uh, it absolutely adds up to re reaffirm such principles of rule-based trading system. It is critical not going back to pre-GATT power-based trade relations, in particularly in today's uh, a context where economic nationalism emerged recently in various major trading nations. Secondly, leaders stress the urgency to ensure enforcement of trade rules and commitments and improves that WTO's negotiation, monitoring, and dispute settlement functions. Enforcement and reforming WTO functions shall certainly, certainly be a priority for MC11. The third area, which is also for the first time in G20 history, leaders agreed to exchange experiences on the mitigation of adjustment cost of trade and investment liberalizations and on uh, certain domestic policies. I think ministers at MC11 could establish a mandate for these critical issues because losers of globalizations have not been fully heard and attended. The fourth area is also for the first time in G20 history. Leaders urgently call for the removal of market distorting subsidies in excessive capacity sectors, such as deals, and find collective solutions to foster a truly leveling playing field. In spite of political difficulties on this issue. This can be discussed further and should fall in within the WTO's uh, MC 11's mandate, WTO's mandate. The fifth area is that, uh, is about facilitation and retaining foreign investment. G20 leaders agreed to seek to identify a strategy to facilitate and retain investment. In MC11, ministers could discuss what could be the key elements of such, in, uh, such strategies for building an open, transparent policy environment on investment. Uh, we have noticed that in WTO, there have been already several workshops and uh, proposals on the table. The six areas I would like to highlight is that uh, the G20 leaders agreed to constructively engage in the WTO discussions on e-commerce and sustain, improve predictable and transparent frameworks on digital, digital trade. We all know that WTO has established a work program on uh, e-commerce about two, almost two decades ago. Whether MC11 is able to deliver meaningful legal requirements or cooperation schemes in digital trade will be a touchstone for, the, for this system to be relevant in digital age. In, con con uh, in concluding, G20 leaders do send a couple of strategic but also very specific messages for open trade and SDG could serve as a, a reference for MC11 uh, ministers' discussion. After this, I hope you are less pessimistic after this ap appetizer from Hamburg uh, but I hope you have a full picture after the whole session. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Wallace. Uh, where is Judith? Is she on the end? Oh, she's sitting next to me. <laughs> Ju Judith Vesahe uh, is our senior development economist at ICTSD. Um, sitting too close to me on the right for me to notice her. <laughs> but I'm sure you'll all notice what she has to say. Judith, go ahead. Thank you, James. I'm going to say a few words, a few remarks, about what participation and upgrading in international trade for firms in developing countries means for the SDGs, about what the SDGs say in terms of a mandate for WTO members, and a few words on what can MC11 and beyond deliver in this regard. So we know that global value chains are now dominating international trade and international production. Around 80% of world trade is now structured around global value chains. If you take a company like IKEA, they now have suppliers spread across 50 countries and they have in-house manufacturing capacity across 11 countries. So what this means is obviously that there have been increasing opportunities for developing countries to participate in global value chains. And we see that from the trade data. Developing countries now account for 45% of world trade in goods. This, is obviously, this has obviously had very important implications in terms of the SDGs. SDGs related to ending poverty, gender equality, if you think of the amount of job creation in specific sectors such as uh, apparel and textile. SDG related to economic growth and reduced inequalities between countries. But after 40 years, we can also see that this has been a very selective process. So many countries and regions have actually been left behind. Between 2006 and 2013, sub-Saharan African share of world export in trading goods has, fell from, has fallen from 5.1 of uh, GDP, of African GDP, to 2.9. So this is shown that actually African suppliers are facing increasing challenges in competing with the st very established suppliers from, especially from Asia. So we also know that participation in global, in, in global value chains does not equate sustainability. And I'm referring here to different types of sustainability. Economic sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental sustainability. In terms of economic sustainability, um, we know that firms, firms in developing countries are often, often trapped in the lowest value added tasks of global value chains, which means that they, they accrue the less profits and the less value added. There are less technology spillovers and knowledge spillovers. Uh, they're also more, more vulnerable to falling prices and uh, price fluctuations. And they're also more exposed to intense competition from lower cost suppliers. So for firms in developing countries to actually move up the value chain, which literally means um, achieving economic transformation and more sustainable and profitable shares in, uh, in, in the, of the value added in global value chains, uh, we need to upgrade and upgrading into uh, uh, better uh, production processes, higher productivity, more sophisticated functions, which are more skills and knowledge intensives, then becomes absolutely critical for firms in developing countries to sustain the incomes and upgrade um, uh, wages and skills. So this speaks directly to SDGs related to industry and innovation and SDGs 10 on reduced inequality within countries and between countries. So how can the international trade system support this? Uh, first of all, in terms of market access and uh, preferential market access and simple rules of origin, we have seen that these have been critical um, in catalyzing foreign direct investment in also in least developed countries. Uh, investment in productive and export capabilities. If you think of a country like Lesotho, they would have not been able to develop an apparel industry without preferences into the uh, US market with sim significantly improved rules of origin. Trade facilitation is critical because one of the critical issues is actually access to the cost of accessing export markets and input markets. And this will lead us later to the trade facilitation agreements. 
And then the role of services. The services are increasingly important in for the participation and upgrading in global value chains for a number of reasons. First of all, because they're critical in inputs to make firms in developing countries more competitive. Second of all, because when we talk about upgrading, often we actually talk about services-related tasks, such as product, prod product design, uh, retail, or marketing. And third of all, because of inclusiveness, because access to finance, for example, is critical to make sure that women and SMEs can participate in international trade. Another important issue is with regard to the policy space to actually craft economic transformation and industrial policies that can support upgrading strategies from developing countries. And this links directly to the issue of special and differential treatment granted by the WTO. Finally, there are a range of productive policies that are absolutely essential to promote economic transformation, and these relate to skills development, infrastructure, development finance, and so forth. In terms of social and environmental sustainability, we know that very often firms, instead of uh, pursuing economic upgrading strategies, have been trapped in a race to the bottom, undermining labor conditions and the environment. The outcomes in terms of inequality and sustainability have often given ground to uh, a lot of skepticism on the possibility of trade to develop, um, to deliver for all and to deliver sustainably. So social and environmental upgrading is essential for the long-term competitiveness of firms in developing countries, but also to increase the legitimacy of the international trade system. And a number of SDGs speak to this in terms of decent work, responsible consumption and production, climate action, marine and land resources, and peace. One of the key areas in international trade that has tried to incorporate these concerns is obviously international standards be these private standards or uh, technical regulations. The SDGs highlight specific areas that the WTO negotiators are supposed to incorporate in the negotiations. There's a general, um, there's a general mandate in terms of strengthening global trade cooperation for sustainable development, and there are specific areas highlighted by the SDGs in terms of aid for trade, implementation of the principle of special and differential treatment, and increasing exports of developing countries, in particular the LDCs, including through the use of duty-free, quota-free market access with simple rules of origin. The Addis Abeba Action Agenda actually reiterates the same issues and expands this issue to, the, um, to incorporate issues of WTO-compatible trade finance and regional integration, especially for Africa. So what can be delivered by the MC11 and beyond in terms of fostering economic upgrading and social and environmental upgrading? Uh, well, duty-free and quota-free market access in developed countries and emerging economies is absolutely critical with simple and transparent rules of origin. Without rules of origin, what we have seen that duty-free and quota-free market access often is not, has not been taken up from, uh, by LDCs. Technical and financial assistance for the implementation of the trade facilitation agreement is important, as well as aid for trade to contribute to supply-side capacity, standards compliance, and designing and implementing domestic regulations on services. Going forward, obviously there are other issues that are equally important. The proliferation of MTBs, sustainable investment, and digital trade. I would like to conclude, to conclude by arguing that actually global trade governance is not sufficient to deliver on economic upgrading from developing countries, especially from the LDCs. For two reasons. First of all, because of the mandate of trade negotiators, and second of all, because of the pace of the negotiations and progress. So other issues are absolutely critical, robust domestic policies to support economic transformation and what these kind of policies should be. Regional cooperation, cooperation uh, first of all, to help smaller economies to tackle with other, region, with other neighboring countries issues that cannot be tackled individually, but also because regulatory convergence and liberalizations may be uh, more ambitious at the regional level. And finally, development finance for multilateral and regional, de and regional development banks into infrastructure and industrial development. This is an issue that has been raised by a number of developing countries. It's very important for the African countries and may be delivered only, especially from new uh, banks coming up, like the BRICS uh, uh, Development Bank. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Judith. I think that's 
perhaps one of the best presentations any of us will hear during these three days, and certainly on a topic that every one of us needs to keep much in mind uh, going toward the ministerial and beyond. Uh, next is uh, Jonathan Hepburn, who will speak to us about uh, uh, the role of the WTO in dealing with hunger and malnutrition. Oh, I'm told that I'm going to keep my campaign promise and we're going to have a break now. Uh, but the break is not for anyone to leave. The break is so that you can ask questions. So feel free to do so and help me through this, if you will, by uh, raising your hand and uh, we'll try to identify you. And these will be questions uh, on the first two presentations. Did I get it right that time, Alice? Okay, I got it right. Uh, yes, sir, you're first. If you would just uh, tell us who you are and where you're from and then have at it. Thank you very much. My name is Christian Mersman and I'm from Hamburg. So uh, Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. Coming from Hamburg, I just wanted to throw one thought for ICTSD uh, into, into the uh, discussion. And that is, I fully agree well, with, what, 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 with what you have been saying. But in the German public in particular, but maybe in entire Europe, there is some real confusion that the radicals of Hamburg, Attac and others, are now of the same opinion as the conservative president of the United States of America when it comes to globalization and so-called free trade. And I think it's an interesting societal debate amongst us. You know, what, what is it really that, that Trump has with his constituency in common that attack and other you know, opponents of regional trade agreements like TTIP and, and others? You know, what, what are the arguments and how can we an analyze to move forward? Because uh, now on the other side of the ocean, there is a president who actually speaks the language of the radicals of Hamburg. If you really take a look at it, maybe a little bit of different wording, but the uh, the argumentation is the same. I just wanted to throw this in. It sounds it for us in Germany. It's really an interesting debate at the moment. Thank you. Well, I can assure you, it's interesting in the United States as well. Um, Wallace, I think you were asked that question. I'll come to you next, sir. This one there and this one, the person on the right. Oh, we want to take all the questions first before we answer. That, that'll get more questions in. Okay, the gentleman who raised his hand is next, uh, and then over here, and then back to the young woman next to the gentleman. Go ahead, sir, tell me your name and uh, your affiliation, and then uh, go on. Thank you. I'm uh, Malcolm Damon uh, from uh, South Africa. Uh, organization that works on economic justice. Uh, I wanted to ask a question to Mr. Cheng. Uh, around uh, the e-commerce, I think he used the word touchstone that um, it would be a touchstone moment for e-commerce at uh, the WM11. Uh, so I just wanted to understand because he also mentioned the fact that there is a work program. So why not keep to the work program? Why should there be why should there be further discussions around this if uh, within the WTO 20, as you've said, 98, it has been agreed. Uh, around the work program. So I just wanted to understand why you're calling this, uh, it should be a touchstone moment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And now your, your question, sir, and then back to the uh, young lady. Yeah, I'm uh, Garen Davis. I'm a UK MP, and I'm here on behalf of the Council of Europe and Rapporteur on New Generation Trade Deals. Welcome uh, to Geneva. Uh, nice to see you. And um, I, I I'm a known Anglophile. It's lovely to see you, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> what I was going to ask about is um, you'll know that in some of the emerging uh, trade deals, like I know TTIP is dead, but if you take CETA as an example, the, uh, the investment chapter has real teeth uh, versus the environmental one and the other uh, sustainability goals, which are just advisory, which means that if, um, if uh, an investor puts money down and... Um, a, a parliament or a democracy passes a law to protect a local citizens from environmental impacts of fracking or obesity from sugar impregnation of foods or whatever it is, um, then there's great power under ICS and the international court system for pursuing those countries. And in, in almost an answer to the, the question from a colleague over there, um, there's concern on the left, as it were, from people who feel that the constraints, the, uh, the arbitration, uh, private law constraints in these in these deals can undermine citizens' rights, both environmentally and human rights, and rights at work. 
and from people like Trump, of course, um, that they undermine democracy itself because they circumvent uh, what governments can do at all. And I was wondering what the panel thought about the opportunities for building in uh, our democracies, rights, human laws, uh, and the Paris Agreement, and of course, obviously, the goals we're talking about today into future trade blueprints. Uh, when, when we finish the questions, uh, I'll take the liberty, perhaps, of answering that one myself. Uh, we're going to take two more questions, uh, this young woman and then you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Deborah James, and I work for the Center for Economic and Policy Research based in the United States. And I'm so glad that you all are doing this event here today. And I wondered if when we look at um, the role of trade in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, if we look at both sides of the ledger. For example, when I balance my checkbook, I have to look at debits and credits, and not only the potential for trade to help achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, but potentially also the way that current trade rules actually constrain developing countries' policy space for achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think of, of three very concrete things um, on the table for Buenos Aires. And one of them, as we know, is that there has been a very big push from developing countries for several years to change existing WTO rules that don't allow them to achieve food security in their own countries um, by supplying their own domestic markets with domestically produced food that don't enter the trade regime. And so there has been a big push by them to have uh, public stockholding programs. And we know that most of the countries of the global north have been opposing this um, because there might at some point be leakage into the trade system while they're still allowed tens of billions of dollars a year in acknowledged trade distorting subsidies. So it seems like this would be something that if we're concerned about achieving the sustainable development goal in food security, that we should all be pushing to have an outcome on uh, public stockholding in Buenos Aires. And uh, on the issue of domestic regulation, which we know is being actively negotiated in the WTO right now, uh, it seems like this would place uh, immense constraints on the uh, democratic policy decision-making process and on national sovereignty in areas of domestic regulation, which uh, we you know, call labor and environment and health protections, um, and actually make it more easy for corporations to change these and have influence in those policies. And finally, on the most biggest uh, topic of e-commerce, it does seem like there is, we all acknowledge there's potential for small businesses and developing countries to gain from participating in e-commerce, but I think that that's very different than negotiating or beginning to talk about negotiating a set of rules, um, most of which the ones that are actually being talked about as potential rules are, you know, proposals from the likes of Google and Amazon and Facebook and Apple and several of the other top biggest multinational corporations in the world right now. Um, and if we want to talk about MSMEs, maybe we could talk about the issues on the agenda that are the proposals from the G90 that they've had for 15 years in the WTO that the developed countries have blocked. So it seems like there's a lot on the agenda that could actually help achieve the SDGs um, coming up in December, but it requires being able to look at the, the ways that, that current rules actually impinge on developing countries as well as the potential for them to grow from them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. James. And lastly... My name is Katerina Serrada. I'm from the University of Milan, Sustainable Development and Trade Program. Uh, my question is quite similar, but I would like to make it more general and address it to Wallace Shen. Uh, the question is, to what extent uh, VWTO can be responsive to the bottom-up approach that has been endorsed by two programs, basically? One is Agenda 2030 and another one is Paris Agreement, because both of the documents, they really endorse the domestic policies and respective capabilities of the countries to address the challenges. To what extent, WTO, because we do have the clashes between the, the between trade and between the uh, domestic needs to, to promote sustainable development, how would be the instrumentalist approach uh, beyond <laughs> Buenos Aires? And um, what what shall we expect at a, pol at a political, uh, from the political and legal aspect? Is it possible to reconcile it? Um, what is the dialogue of where we are moving? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to take your question and his, and then I'll turn it over to Wallace and, and the others. Um, from a historical spec uh, perspective, I think uh, it's often forgotten that the WTO is the result of a bottom-up approach. It began with just 23 countries, uh, and it has grown to 164. And along the way, there have been any number of different issues that have been dealt with. First, 
on a bottom up basis, if you will, which we call a plurilateral basis, uh, among some of the members of the trading system, but not all, and then have uh, over time uh, be become fully multilateral. A uh, mention was made, for example, of standards and technical regulations. Uh, when I was about your age at USTR, uh, someone handed me something called the Standards Code that had just been agreed in the Tokyo round. You know? That was the genesis of what is now the TBT agreement, and so on. So there are quite a few others. And um, it's often overlooked as well that uh, the way in which we're negotiating uh, in the endless Doha round is 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 not the way in which uh, uh, WTO members must negotiate. It's only one of the ways in which the treaty allows them to negotiate. Uh, uh, subsets of WTO members can get together to talk about anything they want, whoever they may be. A group of uh, developing countries, for example, could get together and uh, conclude a particular agreement uh, uh, within the WTO. And uh, I mean, there's some technicalities involved here, depending on how you do it, but it's fully, uh, uh, fully possible. There are uh, in, uh, several precedents for it, and several people are trying to do it now on different issues. Uh, on your question, sir, very important question. We, uh, we don't have time today to delve into the many nuances of investor state dispute settlement. I'll spare everyone. Uh, but uh, you mentioned the CETA, and I think it's important to look carefully at what the CETA is doing in terms of uh, investment dispute settlement. It's uh, very innovative. Uh, essentially, uh, they're going to create uh, 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 two levels of investment tribunals. Uh, which will very much resemble uh, the uh, panels and the appellate body of the WTO, respectively. Uh, they're not going to be privately uh, named uh, arbitrators. They're going to be uh, previously vetted uh, 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 arbitrators uh, uh, who have to run through the same ethical and other hoops uh, that uh, WTO panelists uh, do. And the appellate tribunal will consist of, uh, uh, you know, the eligibility requirements are uh, taken almost word for word from uh, the dispute settlement understanding, Article 17, for members of the appellate body. Uh, so they would have to be uh, uh, expert not only in uh, investment, but other aspects of public international law. They would have to be previously vetted for conflicts. Uh, it's a different approach to investor dispute settlement, and I would say a very good model uh, to be emulated uh, worldwide in investor dispute settlement. That's enough from me. Uh, Wallace, there were a number of other questions directed uh, specifically at you. Thank you. I'm, I'm trying to answer uh, some of them. The first, uh, I, I would, uh, about Hamburg, <laughs> I would say that uh, the Hamburg is a beautiful city, and the people are very amicable, and those Protestants, uh, radicals, are not coming from Hamburg. The second point is that radicals, um, they are sometimes the, a little bit they are overshooting, but they have their reasons. Uh, some, they have some reasons about inequality, about the kind of uh, lost decade or lost decades uh, for middle class peoples, low income groups, including me. So we have some feelings, okay? Middle and income peop, uh, group of people has have some feelings. I think that had, have, as I said, have not yet been fully addressed. The third point is that for G20, for WTO, I think this here is a turning point. Those bad things, those radicals, uh, we call it a crisis. But in Chinese, we have crisis means danger and opportunity, two words. So if we, uh, if we think, address it properly and find, get the diagnosis right, and find a collective solutions, I think there is still hope. But I think we should not address these radicals like radical people. I think there are some reasons we need to be uh, take, care of, take care of that. On the e-commerce, I think, uh, I hope you can stay uh, till the end. We have excellent speaker, Philip, who will address that. I just want to uh, mention that although the work program of e-commerce has uh, been established for two decades, actually they have not delivered anything serious except this um, uh, no duty on econ economic uh, on digital tra transitions, um, and look at what has happening in uh, RTAs, regional trade agreements. There have been a lot happening, and whether 
why WTO uh, should not uh, draw some lessons from uh, this uh, experience at the regional levels to uh, take some actions. This is my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Alice, shall we return to the panelists uh, now, or do you want to take more questions? Do we have time? Uh, if Alice Judith would like a quick response, we can do two. Judith, hmm? I know where you are now. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> No, maybe just one comment on the bottom-up uh, bottom approach. I think the trade facilitation agreement is a good example of uh, uh, what can be done differently in terms of developing countries undertaking um, progressively more um, uh, binding commitments based on financial assistance and technical upgrading. So I think that's an interesting approach in terms of uh, the WTO and sustainability, at least economic sustainability, not necessarily the rest. And then just a comment on the policy space for developing countries. I agree with you. I think it's, uh, I think many developing countries have that as a priority on the agenda. Um, I worked for the past 10 years in Southern Africa and definitely now there is a lot of emphasis on industrial policy and how these industrial policies should be designed, how ambitious they can be, how interventionist they can be, um, and to what extent they should replicate the experience of, you know, Southeast Asian uh, or um, East Asian countries. And I think one of the critical uh, concern now is whether they are allowed to uh, shape these policies, you know, based on constraints at TRIMS and other WTO agreements. So I think definitely, yes, it's high on the, on the agenda for many developing countries. Thank you. All right. On now. You see who's in charge, don't you? Uh, Jonathan, I've already introduced you. You have to speak now. <laughs> Jonathan's going to tell us about food and hunger and malnutrition, a very important topic. Thank you very much, James. Um, it's a, I think the speakers that we've had and also the questions from the people in the room have given us uh, a good overview of the very particular moment that we're at uh, in time. And I think it's quite difficult almost to scroll back two years to 2015 and, and revisit what was actually the outcome of a very, very dynamic process of civil society engagement with governments on what the future should look like, the Rio Plus 20 process, which itself was built on this much, much longer discussion where we should be heading as, uh, as humanity. Um, and the global trading system has a, a role to play in that. Um, if you pick up the, the document um, that came out of that, that rich dialogue process, the SDGs, what's striking today, as you pick it up and you look at the commitments, is their visionary nature. The fact that they're really setting a path through to 2030 for very, very bold and dynamic action. And I think the commitments on food and agriculture and uh, on hunger and malnutrition are uh, a very good example of that. Zero hunger. End hunger and malnutrition by 2030. These are really ambitious statements and commitments that governments have made. You can see them as a step towards a progressive realization of the right to food. You can see them as going, building on and going beyond the Millennium <coughs> Development Goals and the commitments on uh, hunger in from the World Food Summit. This is powerful stuff. And I think one of the things that uh, for the trading system is very difficult is making that huge leap, an intellectual leap from the incrementalism of negotiations on trade. Can we do this, this ministerial, maybe the next ministerial? What about paragraph uh, such and such? How does that relate to the commitments in this footnote mm. to that vision? And that's what I want to talk about today. This vision of zero hunger is, is a, it's all about equity, but it's not just about equity in the present. It's about equity between generations, intergenerational equity. And that's, uh, that, to, to achieve that intergenerational equity, which is a founding principle in the original Rio summit, uh, behind the very idea of sustainable development, we need to think about transforming food systems and transforming agricult the agricultural trading system and the, uh, the global food system as part of that. 
one of the things we need to, to look at is what actually governments and civil society actors and others that were in the room meant when they were talking about ending malnutrition. Because ending hunger is part of that, that package, but ending malnutrition is also about ending other aspects of this triple burden of malnutrition. Undernourishment, the traditional focus of efforts to tackle food and hunger, uh, um, to tackle hunger in the, in the global architecture, but also micronutrient deficiencies, what's called hidden hunger, and overnutrition, obesity, which uh, increasingly is becoming a challenge, not just in developed countries, but also in developing countries. And what the other thing I think comes out of the the um, the SDGs and the Addis uh, Ababa Declaration is a vision of trade as playing a role in achieving this broader vision, but it's just one part. It's clear that governments are going to have to act on a much, much broader agenda, poverty, gender, conflict and insecurity, climate change, energy and inequality, just to name a few things. And unless you act on that broader agenda, actions on trade probably won't get you to where you want to be. So zooming in on trade and food security, what does Agenda 2030 actually mean uh, for action in this area? What does it mean um, for the sorts of things that WTO members need to start thinking about? Well, there's a very specific commitment in there on, on SDG 2, which is the zero hunger goal. Um, SDG 2B talks about correcting and preventing trade restrictions and distortions in world agricultural markets, which is... Uh, which is a clear indication that the the the, uh, the the actors who came together with the with the SDGs were thinking of trade as playing an important role. But if you look beyond SDG two, there are also an awful lot of other um, references to uh, trade and measures that would affect the functioning of markets for food and agriculture. Uh, Judith referred to some of them earlier. Uh, on, on the things that need to be done to help LDCs. Um, right through the whole document, I think maybe uh, Ingrid is going to talk later about some of the other aspects, sustainable production and consumption patterns, a whole bunch of different things. Ingrid, I'm just preempting gratuitously what you're going to be saying. But um, th the point is you need to take a holistic look at this text and these different documents that came out of the 2015 process to really understand what role trade can, could and should play uh, in achieving some of these broader visionary objectives. And I think a lot of my work is on agriculture and agricultural trade specifically, but I think it's really important to look beyond agriculture and try and understand how policies in other sectors can affect small farmers, can affect poor people's access to food by uh, affecting whether governments are able to create jobs and raise people's uh, incomes, both in rural areas and in urban areas as well. <coughs> How much progress has been there been to date? Well, um, the FAO has actually just come out with some pretty bad news about uh, the number of hungry people in the world today. Um, after decades of progress in reducing the number of hungry people, uh, there's now been an increase. The, there's, the, the agencies that are involved in, in looking at these numbers reckon that there was an uptick in the number of hungry people. It's now 815 million people that are estimated in 2016 to have been affected by undernourishment. And the FAO and the other international agencies put this down to conflict, increased conflict, especially in certain countries uh, which have, have led to situ situations of famine, uh, compounded with climate change uh, and weather-related vulnerabilities. Um, that's got to be seen against the broader picture of progress. There are uh, about 200 million fewer hungry people than there were back in the 90s. And also regional disparities. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is facing particular challenges which uh, other regions don't face. So what can WTO members do at MC11, the Ministerial Conference in Buenos Aires, and beyond? Well, uh, m many WTO members are very pleased with themselves, as pr probably they should be, um, because of their achievement at the Nairobi Ministerial in eliminating export subsidies, agreeing progress on one of the key points that was mentioned in the SDGs as something that needed to be done. 
But I would argue that a paradigm shift is needed. Countries need to go much, much further. And they need, it's not just a matter of going faster. It's actually about a complete change in focus and a complete shift. Some of that needs to happen outside the WTO, and some of it needs to happen inside the, the WTO. Um, there's a lot that WTO members could do to support poor producers, including by supporting investment. Um, uh, the, the SDGs talk in some detail about what needs to be done to tackle persistent low levels of agricultural productivity around the developing world, uh, especially the, ch the challenges facing small farmers. There's a lot that governments could do, uh, including through providing more support for public goods, research, extension services, infrastructure, all those sorts of things uh, which are widely recognised as being needed and d which aren't really prevented um, under WTO rules. There's also a, an awful lot that governments could do to help poor consumers uh, to, to improve the access amongst poor consumers to safe, sufficient and nutritious food, for example, through ramping up social protection schemes and providing better help to people who are trapped in poverty. But what about the WTO? What, what's the role of the WTO in this? Well, um, there's a number of areas where trade distortions on global markets affect um, the achievement of food security. Um, that could include in the area of agriculture, but also in fisheries, as Alex is, I think, going to address soon, energy, other goods and services. And all these relate to food security. There's a tendency often we, we think about WTO, we think about agriculture, uh, we zoom in on that area, but actually there's a much, much broader picture that, that people need to start thinking about. Um, and part of that is ne the need to address past imbalances in the gl global trading system and in the set of rules that we've inherited at the WTO, which, as many developing countries rightly point out, are unfair. They're deeply unfair in many important ways. But there's also a need to balance action in that area with establishing a fair basis for trade in the future. And I think that at the moment, that's the challenge uh, that governments are struggling with. So in conclusion, um, what we need is not business as usual, more of the same, another ministerial conference with more nice declarations and uh, debates about footnotes and paragraphs and things like that. We need a paradigm shift. We need to, to place the vision of the SDGs right at the heart of the action in the WTO. We know that climate change is going to intensify many of the challenges that the poorest and most vulnerable communities around the world will face in the years ahead. There are already signs of that. Governments need to start acting now if they're to ensure that trade is able to contribute to the SDG Zero Hunger Goal. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, next is Alice Tipping, who is going to talk to us about the sustainable use of marine resources and the role of the trading system in that. Alice. Thank you very much indeed, Jim. Um, I'll start perhaps with a reminder of the very, very big picture. Um, ocean seas and inland bodies of water are a crucial part of the global ecosystem, and they play an extremely important role in sustainable development generally. Oceans, I was interested to learn the other day, they produce half of the planet's oxygen. They fix a quarter of the world's carbon dioxide. They're a critical contributor to food security and nutrition. In 2013, they provided more than 3 billion people with almost 20% of the animal protein they eat. They're an important source of employment. Together, capture fisheries and aquaculture support the livelihoods of between 10 and 12 per cent of the world's population. 10 to 12 per cent of the entire global population depend on capture fisheries and agriculture, aquaculture for their livelihoods. So it's perhaps not surprising that oceans are in a very important part of the 2030 agenda. It has an entire goal. Goal 14, of course, is dedicated to oceans and marine resources, but the importance of these resources and the habitats are reflected in a number of different places across the agenda. And several of these references, I think, speak directly to trade and economic policy. Target 14B under Goal 14 refers specifically to improving small-scale fishers' access to marine resources and markets. 
And the focus on the livelihoods of small-scale producers is also brought out in Target 2.3, under Goal 2, which focuses on ending hunger, again focusing on this link between food security and fisheries. And that target refers to doubling the productivity and incomes of small-scale food producers, including fishers, by improving access to resources and access to markets. And access to markets is something that the WTO knows a lot about. Um, one of the most explicitly trade-related targets in the SDGs is one that will be very familiar to the rules negotiators here, Target 14.6, which refers to the prohibition of certain forms of fisheries subsidies that contribute to overcapacity and overfishing. It's language that reflects almost exactly the mandates uh, that were established in Hong Kong for the WTO negotiations here. But the target also refers specifically to the elimination of subsidies that relate to IUU fishing activities, and that's a topic that I'll come back to in a bit, late, a bit later. So how are we doing against all of these very lofty targets? Well, in terms of the sustainability of fisheries harvests, not great, but more or less stable. Most fisheries for which the FAO collects data are already fully exploited. Some 31 per cent, that's almost a third, are already overfished and only around 10% might be able to produce larger harvests. What does this mean? It means basically that wild fisheries' abilities to continue to meet the, f the food and nutrition needs of a, glowing gro of a glo growing global population are likely to be limited. In terms of trade and access to international markets, fisheries exports from developing countries alone in 2013 were worth more than 80 billion US dollars. And what's interesting is that fisheries products actually generate more revenue for developing countries overall than many other agricultural commodities, including coffee, rubber, cocoa, and bananas, something that the agricultural negotiators might find interesting. Um, a relatively new issue on the trade policy landscape uh, is the question of trade measures taken to address IUU fishing. Um, so IUU, for those, of us, for those of you not deeply immersed in fisheries parlance, refers to illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Now, how are we doing here? Well, the global losses from IUU fishing are estimated to be between 10 and $23 billion a year. And interestingly, some estimates actually suggest that between 20 and 32% of all of the fish imported into the United States may be sourced from illegal fishing. So this is obviously a question where trade policy has a close link uh, to governance and rule of law issues, and there's a, because there's also a significant correlation between the incidence of IUU fishing uh, and weak governance. Now to address this, some very large fisheries import markets, the United States and the EU, have moved ahead with their own unilateral trade measures, uh, which, for example, in the case of the EU, include a requirement that fish imported carry its own catch certificate. So market access, IUU fishing, and trade measures taken to address it. Um, the last issue specifically that's been around for a long time in the trade context is, of course, the question of subsidies, uh, the question targeted specifically in 14.6. Um, now, one of the most recent, most comprehensive estimates, not official numbers, but estimates, suggest that at a global level, fisheries subsidies are worth around, are worth around $35 billion <coughs> per year of which around $20 billion are capacity enhancing. That's to say subsidies that tend to encourage the exploitation of fisheries resources beyond sustainable limits. So we already have, at least on the questions of market access on IUU fishing and on subsidies, a number of specific areas where trade policy responses, I would argue, are called for. Um, so what is the guidance that we can see from the SDGs for MC11 and beyond? The first key deliverable uh, is obviously a, meaning ag a meaningful agreement on new multilateral rules on fishery subsidies at MC11. Now this <coughs> appears to be one of the most likely potential outcomes of the conference, but it's still going to require a lot of significant, a lot of political will and a significant amount of technical work. There are a number of proposals on the table, um, several of which refer specifically to the question of prohibiting subsidies to IUU fishing. So that's a direct response, I think, to the target in 14.6 and a direct way that the WTO could contribute to the SDGs and their agenda. Um, there are a number, of, a number of other ideas on the table, for example, prohibiting subsidies that affect overfished stocks. So as I mentioned before, some 31 or so percent of all the stocks that the FAO assesses are assessed to be overfished. So that could be a prohibition with a considerable scope. There are other ideas on the table um, referring specifically to prohibiting subsidies that contribute directly to overcapacity, subsidies that contribute directly to overfishing. 
There's, there are proposals on the table that would increase the transparency uh, of the fisheries subsidies that governments provide. And there are a number of proposals on the table that would temper the ambition of some of the prohibitions with a degree of special and differential treatment. So that's the first key, uh, key deliverable that the WTO um, could contribute to the achievement of the SDGs at MC11. Beyond MC11 on subsidies, there are at least two potential streams of work implementing and monitoring the eventual disciplines and potentially even building on them to establish more, ambition, more ambitious rules, be it in a regional or a plurilateral context. The second very broad area of trade policy that could contribute to SDG objectives around oceans and marine resources is coming back to the question of IUU fishing. Specifically, the use of trade measures uh, that can contribute to eliminating the products of IUU fishing from large import markets. Now, we know that there are already unilateral measures in place, but the ideal would be to have large importing countries coordinate their efforts to close international trade to IUU fishing while ensuring that there's a, a degree of close coordination with and support to countries that export fisheries products. So in a sense, that would be a way of using the trade system to support better governance of natural resources. From coordination of unilateral measures, governments could move gradually towards plurilateral or ultimately multilateral trade disciplines once a critical mass of countries is reached. Governments could even consider, and this is where I push the negotiators slightly, could even consider using the WTO as a forum to negotiate a code of conduct on measures addressing illegal fish trade, for example. So developing new rules on subsidies to fishing based on their environmental rather than their trade impact is a very new kind of role for the trade system, and the WTO in particular, but it seems to have a significant degree of political support. Using the trade system to limit trade in illegally sourced fish products is an even more novel role for the trade system, but I think it's a key opportunity for the WTO in particular to demonstrate its relevance and to demonstrate the value of a, co of a cooperative approach to what is in effect a collective sustainable development challenge. Short and sweet. Thanks, James. Thank you, Alice, uh, very much. Uh, next is Ingrid Chagou, who will talk to us about uh, climate action, access to clean energy, climate change, and the rela relations among them. Thank you very much. Um, so we are running out of time, so I think I'll keep this a bit shorter than I had intended, and then I will refer you to copies of a, of a paper um, outside uh, the room that you can look into for more detail. Um, so um, <coughs> climate change, uh, as we have been able to observe over the past few months with all the hurricanes and natural disasters that are going on, climate change is happening. Uh, the good news is that nearly all the uh, UNFCCC parties have submitted their climate plans, their INDCs, uh, in the strive to um, stop or to limit global warming to uh, below 2 degrees Celsius. Um, however, even if these were to be fully implemented, that would not uh, be enough. Uh, we are rather heading towards a scenario of about 3 or 3.2 degrees warming. Um, and this threatens the chances of fulfilling a number of SDGs. Uh, first and foremost, foremost, SDG 13, which is the one uh, about climate action. Um, but climate is also uh, related to many other SDGs, and as was mentioned by Alice, for instance, a little while ago. And um, poverty elevation will not be possible unless climate change is adequately addressed. So um, a widespread, widespread upscale of climate action is urgently needed with uh, massive improvements in energy efficiency and a scale up in renewable energy uh, with enhanced access to clean energy technologies. Uh, and this would also contribute to addressing SDG number seven, which is about enhancing access to um, affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. Um, so there are uh, important uh, things that the trade system could do to support these um, sustainable development goals. And I will briefly touch upon three of them. Uh, the first one is uh, the issue of subsidies. Um, as um, counterintuitive as it is, um, a great number of governments actually subsidize the use of um, fossil fuels. 
Um, and estimates range from $325 billion a year uh, to fi over $5 trillion, depending on whether you count the uh, externalities. Um, so there is an SDG which uh, calls for uh, fossil fuel subsidy reform, um, target 12C. Uh, and indeed ending uh, global fossil fuel subsidies uh, would reduce um, global carbon emissions by 20% according to the IMF. And fossil fuel subsidies are related to a range of other negative uh, effects as well, uh, such as um, health damages, air pollution and so on. Um, then turning to clean energy subsidies, um, uh, these are necessary for um, achieving SDG number seven on ensuring access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. Um, still, these subsidies are considerably smaller uh, than the, the fossil fuel subsidies, so about 150 billion per year uh, compared to the 325 that I mentioned for fossil fuels. Um, <coughs> and when it comes to clean energy subsidies, um, we know that uh, they are still necessary to support uh, a still young sector. So w uh, what about the trade system? So what can the trade system do about this? Well, <coughs> what, the, what we have seen uh, lately is that there are a number of, number of cases coming to the WTO which relate to clean energy subsidies and a number of anti-subsidy investigations. Um, and this uh, generates uncertainty for the clean energy sector, which has a, a chilling effect on, on investment. Uh, at the same time, we don't really see any cases on the issue of fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, so this is something uh, where the, the WTO should, um, should take action. So they should, uh, or they could, either act within the subsidies agreement to restrict the use of fossil fuel subsidies, and we have looked at different um, different options for do doing that. Another alternative would be to actually develop a new uh, legal Good instrument, sense. because the, fossil, um, the subsidies agreement refers to uh, subsidies that have a trade distortive effect. Mm -hmm. But the main problem is not that the fossil fuel subsidies distort trade, it's that they damage the climate. So possibly creating a new legal instrument would be more effective. And when it comes to clean energy subsidies, well, the WTO system should offer some more clarity to, to uh, get away from this, these uncertainties that, that have a chilling effect. Um, so this could include um, clarifying the scope of the subsidies agreement when it comes to clean energy subsidies, uh, but also to, more, um, to be more proactive and, and actually um, establishing, for instance, a time-limited peace clause uh, where uh, members would agree not to challenge in dispute settlement uh, uh, certain carefully selected categories of clean energy subsidies. Um, my second point is access to technologies. Um, SDG 17.7 calls for promotion of the development, transfer, dissemination and diffusion of environmentally sound technologies. And target 7A calls for enhanced international cooperation to facilitate access to clean energy research and technology and for promotion of investment in energy infrastructure and clean energy technology. Um, and obviously the trade system plays an important role in this, in this area. Uh, for the moment, uh, manufacturing of clean energy technologies is re um, concentrated in a handful of countries. Uh, so, if we want to uh, to see a global scale up of clean energy technologies, then we need to rely on, on international trade to a great extent. Um, therefore, removing distortions in global market for clean energy technologies would help improve uh, access to the technologies. Um, intellectual property protection, which is regulated in part by trade agreements, is also a key issue in increasing access and transfer of clean energy technologies. So, uh, what has been done to date? Well, there is a mandate in the Doha round to uh, liberalize uh, trade in environmental goods and services. Um, the APEC, uh, well, APEC has agreed to a list of environmental goods, of 54 env environmental goods for tariff reduction. And there is also a negotiation that has been taking place here in Geneva uh, towards an environmental goods agreement. It's a plurilateral 
uh, WTO agreement. So what more uh, can the WTO? Well, first of all, I think that the WTO needs to ensure that um, the EGA negotiations are being picked up and successfully concluded. Uh, the list that they uh, will negotiate should reflect um, all the relevant uh, climate uh, friendly technologies, so looking both at mitigation and adaptation technologies. And it's also important to, to ensure that, uh, that, that there is a, an inbuilt mechanism that would allow to update this list as new technologies develop. Thank you. Um, so my third point is about uh, carbon pricing. Uh, carbon pricing is only mentioned very briefly in uh, the 2030 agenda in uh, paragraph 69 of the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. But it is an important climate policy tool. Um, some 40 governments and more than 20 cities, states and regions um, have, a, have put a price on carbon, and which now covers about 12% of global emissions. And China is currently developing its national emissions trading scheme, which uh, once implemented will be the world's largest, largest carbon market. Um, but it's important to notice that current efforts regarding carbon pricing around the world are very fragmented, uh, both when you look at the coverage, which sectors are covered by the carbon price, and the actual price itself. And in a world of unequal carbon prices, a key challenge which is confronting climate policymakers is how to implement stringent national carbon abatement measures, while at the same time tackling what is called carbon leakage, so emissions moving to other countries and related uh, competitiveness concerns. So there are um, different models for addressing these concerns. They include, for instance, free allowances, which is widely used in emissions trading schemes, border carbon adjustment, which is for the moment a hypothetical um, tool, um, and also the possible possibility of linking um, carbon pricing schemes or creating carbon pricing clubs. So. Um, just to, to wrap up, what can governments at the WTO do to help this uh, achieve this? Well, I think that the WTO should start by acknowledging that there are trade-related concerns um, in the area of carbon pricing, and that some of the measures which countries use or contemplate to address these may actually have WTO ramifications. Um, and therefore, the WTO needs to take a proactive approach in addressing these concerns um, and perhaps considering um, using the trade and environment, the Committee on Trade and Environment, uh, to um, design guidelines uh, or have a better understanding of the of the challenges. Thank you. Ingrid, thank you very much. Uh, lastly, we're going to turn to Felipe Sandoval to talk about. Um, services and digital trade, and then, time permitting, we'll uh, take some more questions. Uh, we are running a bit short on time. Go ahead, Felipe. Thank you, James. Uh, well, originally, we had thought of a 10 to 15 minute presentation, so given that we only have five minutes left and the priority is for you at the public forum, uh, I'll do it extremely fast, and I'll say the following. Uh, on digital and in services, when you look at the 17 SDGs, you pretty much figure that there's something for either digital trade or trade and services to say or to do within each one of these 17 goals. So in order to make a presentation effective, one needs to pick a few. And what I did is that I basically picked four. Um, on gender equality, on quality of education, decent work and, and economic growth, and industry innovation and infrastructure. And along each one of these, what you can identify is a specific target with a specific indicator, and then a measurement or an evaluation. But for these three segments, we needed to find something that it was directly related either to the digital economy or to trade and services. And the fact of the matter is that there is specific language for either of them in each one of these four selected items. Now, because of time, I cannot go through each one of them, but I can tell you very briefly that if you go to SDG4, 
you want to look at the target for A. If you go to SDG5, you want to look to 5B. If you go to SDG8, you probably want to look to the target A.10. And if you go to SDG9, you probably want to look to the targets 9.1 and 9.3. Now, the first observation is that overall, there's progress for each one of these goals. And that is a measurable and measured fact. So the question is not whether we are going in the right direction, which seems to be the case. The question is rather, are we doing it at the right speed? And two, is the trade community doing its share of the work? And as a former trade negotiator, and I did this for almost 15 years, and I can still see a number of familiar faces in the room, I still have the feeling that the level of awareness, um, going back to the initial statement by Jonathan, you know, this change of paradigm, we need to place the vision, the SDGs, as you know, a vision of the world, of humanity, in the center of trade policy. And that has not been the case for too long, not to blame, but for too long, trade negotiators had, and I had, simply taken for granted that what we were doing was for the good of humanity. Some may agree, some may disagree, but that was ultimately what drove me in what I was doing. So the next question would be, what can the WTO or members of the WTO, either at the WTO or outside the WTO, do in order to incorporate this vision into what they do, which is trade negotiations, is treaty law. How do you reflect the vision encompassed in the 17 SDGs into a treaty on trade? And that is not an easy question. Now, the initial observation suggests that the landscape is not entirely empty. There are some areas of progress, and some countries or blocks of countries have started, have begun to make progress on trying to include this vision into trade. However, it's not enough. The pace is not rapid enough. The depth is not enough. So there is a challenge, and these are basically the two challenges, raising the awareness of the trade community, and second, trying to work on frameworks within trade agreements which address this vision. Now, and as I go into the five minutes, um, one way, or let's say one, one, one language that's been around for some time now, this language about a development dimension, doesn't that, to a great extent, relate to the achievement of the 17 SDGs. Our assessment, in my assessment, is that, yes, it doesn't do it completely or entirely, and it doesn't associate it to a particular agenda, but it sets goals. Um, now, on the specific of e-commerce and, and trade and services, uh, when we look at a WTO, what we see is a fragmented, a cracked panorama. Uh, while there's a large group of members who would wish to begin negotiations on these two fronts, uh, there is a substantive portion of the membership which does not feel comfortable, neither ready to engage. And perhaps one of the reasons behind this is the fact that the institutional knowledge, training, legal and regulatory asymmetries between the developing world and the developed world, and even within the developing world, and even within LDCs, are real. And unless they are addressed, 
either prior to or during or after the course of a negotiation, it would be very difficult for those who lack this institutional strength to willingly engage in a negotiation where the benefits of it do not seem to be clear. Why would I engage in a negotiation where I feel that it is the other party, the one who's always really taking most of the benefit, whereas I just sit down, sign, in the hope that things will change, that things ultimately either do not change or change very little. Now, um, end to end. Um, now, we had this, this, this conversation at ICTSZ a couple of days ago. And, 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 and one very important point, which again takes me back to what Jonathan was saying, is that at the end, and this is the message that I'd like to pass to my former colleagues in the trade community, is at the end, what is at stake is the legitimacy of the system for which we're we working on. We got lazy. We thought that we had it, and we let it run for too long. And now we need to make the case all over again, and it's going to take you know, a lot of work. It is possible. MC11, it is a platform, can be used, uh, but certainly will not do the trick by itself. And, and the challenge really relies beyond Buenos Aires. Thank you. Felipe, thank you very much. I believe we have run out of time, and there are others waiting to use the room. We want to uh, thank you very much for uh, your attendance and participation, and we look forward to working with you in the days to come.